and it's my dubious pleasure to introduce the speaker who's giving the keynote address. Um, I won't take up any of your precious time with the details, so let's move on. Um, I want to talk about the life course and the importance of early childhood. To remind you, in my book, The Health Gap, the first line was, why treat people and send them back to the conditions that made them sick? I say this to my medical colleagues, to people in health departments, we need to deal with the conditions that made people sick. And we have a problem. In 2017, my colleagues and I drew attention to the stalling life expectancy in the UK. And at the time, we were told it was an artifact, a bad winter, the flu, obesity, anything other than adversity, austerity, or a health crisis. The latest figures, life expectancy has nearly, the growth in life expectancy has nearly stopped in England. Life expectancy is going down in Scotland, going down for men in Northern Ireland, and going down in Wales. Colleagues, this is a health crisis. Now, a rapid change didn't start in early childhood, but early adversity is important in setting what will happen in the future. Does the USA represent our future? Life expectancy, I made up this slide, had declined two years in a row. I was sitting at a meeting in Hong Kong in November, got a call from the BBC World Service in London asking me to comment on the fact that that day's news was life expectancy in the US had declined three years in a row. And the big increase is poisonings. Accidental deaths due to poisonings, which includes a drug overdose, 63,600, and that was out of date by a year last year, uh, 70,000 deaths. It's psychosocial in origin. And when I look at what's happened in the US, particularly looking at a measure that UNICEF comes up with of adversity in young people, where they combine neonatal mortality, suicide in young people, uh, mental health, drunkenness, and it ranks OECD countries, the US is nearly at the bottom. Adversity starting early in life, psychosocial, leading to problems like accidental poisoning, suicide, alcohol later in life. And the mind is an important gateway by which the social environment influences health is mental illness and well-being and psychosocial pathways to physical illness. This can be through behaviors and also through stress pathways. And again, that's why adversity in early childhood is so important. I'm talking about health, but I'd like to ask you to keep a second idea in your head. I know that's complicated for most of us to have two ideas at once, but let's for the moment think about health and something else. In the health gap, I wrote about Baltimore. In, and it looks a bit like Glasgow in the sense of dramatic inequalities in health between small areas of the city. In the poorest part of Glasgow, life expectancy is 20 years shorter than in the, in the poorest part of Baltimore. Life expectancy is 20 years shorter than the rich part. As I've said, if you live in Roland Park um, and you want to see what it's like to live in a place with life expectancy 20 years shorter, you could fly to Ethiopia 
not, I hasten to add, on a Boeing 737-800 MAX, or whatever it's called, uh, but you could fly to Ethiopia. Safer would be to go across town. Well, I say safer. I was interested in what it means to grow up in these two parts of Baltimore, and I put in bold, so there are problems with poverty, single parent families, kids doing poorly in school. But each year, a third of young people aged 10 to 17 were arrested for a juvenile disorder. One third each year. It means the chance of getting to age 18 without having been arrested is really quite slim. And a high rate of shootings, including homicide. So the second idea is crime, civil unrest. In fact, when they had riots in Baltimore, the precipitant for the riot in Baltimore was the killing of a black man by the police, or should I say one more killing of a black man by the police. But the underlying cause was inequality because it wasn't Baltimore that rioted, it was Upton Druid the area where the young kids are being nabbed off the streets for goodness knows what and being locked up and being shot at. In Roland Park, two parent families, high household income, the kids do well in school. Juvenile arrests, not one in three, one in 50 per year. And no non-fatal shootings and four homicides, not 40. The two ideas, in fact, one idea, my two ideas are health and crime. There's, I don't know if you're having the same crisis about knife crime in Scotland. It's a crisis of the newspapers, I think. But uh, people are very concerned about knife crime. My argument is the social determinants of ill health and the social determinants of misbehavior overlap. When we had the riots in the summer riots in London 2011, they broke out in Tottenham. I had been showing this graph of life expectancy in small areas of London. The shortest was in Tottenham and the longest was in Kensington and Chelsea. The riots didn't happen in Kensington and Chelsea. The riots happened in Tottenham. And young people who were arrested in those riots, 91% were not in education, employment, or training. Neat. 91% at a time when the national figure was around 12%. Young people who had a stake in the future did not riot. But young people who had no hope and a life of poor health before them were the ones who went out onto the street. I've got interested of late in health of indigenous peoples in Canada, in the Americas, and in Australia. The life expectancy gap between indigenous Australians and non-indigenous Australians, um, 10.4 years for men, uh, 10.6 years for men, 9.4 years for women. And on a visit last year, I was taken to Alice Springs in the Northern Territory, and then to Arayonga, two hours drive from Alice Springs in the middle of the desert. This is downtown Arayonga. They took me to the health clinic. Let me deviate for a moment. And they proudly showed me that they're focusing on prevention of obesity and diabetes, and they recommend that people eat fruit and vegetables. They're in the middle of the desert. Do you know how much an apple costs in Alice Springs? These are people with no income at all. There is no meaningful employment in Arionga. The only thing you can do is crime. It's the only way of getting any money. And the idea that people are going to follow sensible, healthy eating advice to prevent obesity and diabetes is beyond stupid. 
And this is Alice Springs, the largest building, is the Supreme Court of the Northern Territory, it looms over the rest of Alice Springs. The incarceration rate of Indigenous Australians in the Northern Territory, 2,400 per 100,000, 13 times the figure for non-Indigenous Australians in the Northern Territory. If you go and visit a prison in the Northern Territory, 84% of the prison population is Indigenous, and it's 27% of the general population. And the overwhelming majority of these prisoners have a diagnosed mental illness. What a thing to do to people with mental illness. Young, damaged people, lock them up in prison. What will that do? And parenthetically, the incarceration rate in the UK is around 148 per 100,000. Japan, it's 48. The United States, it's 700 per 100,000. That's what they do. They lock up those young people in Baltimore. So you can see the picture that I'm building up of starting in early childhood. Um, I'll swap over that. Um, starting in early childhood, you've got the determinants of mental illness. And mental illness is one of the things that gets you locked up. I looked at some figures that claim 10% of prisoners in Denmark have a diagnosed mental illness, 80% in the UK. I don't know whether the right figure is 10% or 80% of prisoners have a mental illness, but it's a lot. And so my response to reading about this paranoia about knife crime is exactly what we're talking about today in preventing adverse child experiences. Not only will it improve the mental health and the physical health of young people, it'll give them a stake in society. They won't be involved in drug dealing and gangs and knife crime and the like. So, prevent mental illness in children. Can we do it? Well, my WHO Commission on Social Determinants of Health, we said on the cover, social injustice is killing on a grand scale. And that, I think, was the theme of the minister's address to us this morning. Everything she laid out was in a spirit of social justice. And in my English review, putting that into practice, I had six domains of recommendation. The first was giving every child the best start in life, then education and lifelong learning, employment and working conditions, having enough money to live on. The fifth, healthy and sustainable places to live and work. And the sixth, taking a social determinants approach to prevention. And often I'm asked, if you had to choose one, which one would you choose? And my answer is, they're all connected. Income, housing, early childhood experience, they're all connected. It's not one, we need to follow all six of these because of the tight connection between them. So let me just start briefly with the life course. Some of you will have heard me talk about this in the previous meetings that I've laid out, and I can't bring myself to show you the same slides, so I talk about it in a slightly different way. Given that one of the themes of today is ACEs, Adverse Child Experiences, looking at ACEs in England by socioeconomic level. And for these uh, different ACEs, adverse child experiences, pretty well all of them follow the social gradient. And it's not the case that it's the poor children who are suffering ACEs and everybody else is okay. It's a social gradient. The lower you are in the social hierarchy, the more likely you are to suffer. And that suggests two approaches. One is prevent poverty and inequalities. 
bring the social and economic level of the people down the bottom up towards the middle, and there will be better early child development and fewer adverse child experiences. And the other is break the link between deprivation and adverse child experiences, and as the minister said, deal with the consequences of ACEs. So what about poverty? She said part of the Scottish strategy is to deal with the consequences of policy set in the United Kingdom. This is looking at the effects of the Chancellor's 2015 cuts to changes to taxes and benefits. And look at the bottom graph. This is families with children. So the predicted changes between 2015 and 2019 for, by deciles of income, for people in the bottom 10% of income, they will, as a result of the government's changes to the tax and benefit system, have nearly a 10% drop in household income. People in the second bottom decile will have a 12% drop. And then the higher your income, the less the reduction as a result of the Chancellor's changes to the tax and benefit system. A senior politician said to me in London, said to me, I've been listening to your, the evidence you gave to the Scottish Parliament and you're anti-government. And I said, no, I'm not. I'm anti-health inequalities. Any policy that's likely to make child poverty worse, I have to oppose. And here's a sharply regressive policy that will make child poverty worse. I'm against it. Not because I'm against government, but because I'm in favor of health equity. And if we look at the proportion of families with children below the minimum income threshold from 2008-9 to 2013, it goes from 31% to 39% in households with children. And so characteristics of housing and neighborhood matter for health. It's not one or t'other and it's related to childhood. In London, the proportion of children growing up in households in poverty, where poverty is defined as an income less than 60% of the median, is 17%. After housing costs, it's 37%. My Institute of Health Equity, <coughs> produced a report on child poverty, <coughs> excuse me, and child poverty as well as growing up in a cold home affecting respiratory disease, you notice I cough for effect, um, respiratory disease uh, has an adverse impact on mental illness and on children's intellectual development. Children growing up in cold homes, perform less well in school, other things equal. And with the massive shift away from social housing to the private rental sector, and it is a massive shift, particularly in London, more people are in the private rental sector and the quality of housing in the private rental sector is worse than in the social rental sector. So we've moved vast numbers of households with children from relatively affordable, reasonable quality social housing to unaffordable, poor quality, private rental housing. The Lancet Medical Journal asked me to go and review an exhibition of photographs my demise as a serious scientist is official. The Lancet asked me to go and review photo exhibitions. Um, and the one that, the last one I did, which will be published tomorrow, I think, tomorrow or Saturday, uh, was Bedrooms of London, 
a photo exhibition of what it's like for children growing up homeless. And accompanying the pictures was text of interviews with the mothers. I can't read that, so I've got to hear, you can. Um, Emily and Martin and their baby sleep on the sofa bed in the living room, the other three children in the bedroom. Martin is working. He earns 800 pounds a month. And outside, the older kids, they're drug dealers, and the parents don't want to let the kids go out. So they're stuck in this tiny, tiny apartment. Three teenagers and a nine-year-old sleeping in one be bedroom. Both parents work, but they still have to have their rent subsidized. The area is full of gangs. I want my children to live in a safe neighborhood, says the mother. I thought, this room has everything and the kitchen sink all in one room. Emily's partner left when she was five months pregnant. She said, at the beginning, I didn't have benefits, so I didn't have food. I was crying for no reason. For no reason. She puts a towel under the door to stop the weed smoke from coming in. They're in a hostel, and hers is the only child in this hospital. Everyone else is smoking weed. A Nigerian mother with an, an English father and three children, they have a two-bedroom luxury. And she said, to know that somebody somewhere is making something available for you to be happy. My feeling welcome in this country has been all through charities. Just in case you'd ever heard a politician blaming poor people for their own misfortune, that they're feckless, or somehow the architects of their own misfortune. And this mother says, Nobody falls into this trap on purpose because your whole life is going to be a trap, a trap. And then you will see yourself living a life you never thought you would. Coming back to the Northern Territory of Australia and telling people to eat fruit and vegetables in the middle of the desert, the Food Foundation calculated that if people followed Public Health England's healthy eating advice, for people in the bottom 10% of households in England, they would consume 74% of household income in food. In Scotland, 67%. And we blame them for not eating healthily. They could, I suppose, eat, but then they couldn't pay the rent. Or they could pay the rent, and then they couldn't eat. Or they could pay the rent, and then they couldn't heat the flat. And we blame people for their bad behavior. So this is the context in which adverse child experiences happen. Poor housing, overcrowding, poverty, struggling to make ends meet. But I have good news. It's not all a tale of woe. Coventry has declared itself a Marmot City. I was in Gateshead recently. They said, could we be a Marmot City? We're talking to Manchester. I mentioned I was in Italy, in Bologna. They said, if we declared ourselves a Marmot City, an Italian Marmot City, would you come back? Would I? Uh, yes, I would. Um, <laughs> Trieste said that they're an Italian Marmot city. And I'm just in the process of completing a commission for the Pan American Health Organization on equity and health inequalities in the Americas. And we already have a network, a health equity network of the Americas that's taking off.
lots of good things happening. And my two messages in a world of post-fact politics is that we need evidence-based policy, but presented in a spirit of social justice. Remember, we said on the cover of the Commission on Social Determinants of Health report, social injustice is killing on a grand scale.